Garnet Region 1 and 3 welcome you. Well, it's not new. For nearly five decades, research in our country has shown that family and community involvement with children's education has a significant influence on improved educational outcomes. And by children, this means all children. Is it the only factor to improved educational outcomes? Well, no, yet it is a strong contributor. Research has compared outcomes for children whose families were encouraged and supported to be involved to children whose families didn't. Do you believe, well, do you think, that when families are involved in their children's education, these children attend school more regularly than children whose families are less involved? They do. Do you think children obtain higher grades? They do. As they grow, do you think they will complete more homework? They will. Do you believe that when families are involved in their children's education, that those children demonstrate more positive attitudes and more positive behaviors? Yes. Do you think that research has found students graduate from high school at higher rates? It has. And what about college? Do you believe that children whose families are involved are more likely to enroll in college? They are. There are many professional organizations like the Division of Early Childhood of the Council of Exceptional Children and the National Association for the Education of Young Children who are endorsing this research and applying it to practice. So with all this research, state and federal statutes, guidance and policies, how can this old news be made new? With proactive being defined as taking the initiative, how can we move forward? How can this knowledge be turned into a proactive approach? Starnet Region 1 and 3 Family Resource Specialist decided to ask the thoughts of a very highly involved community member and some families, a few of whom also work professionally in education. All of these families have children with disabilities. Here's what we learned, broken down into a few categories. We'll start with communication. It is defined as the giving and exchanging of information. So it's the families and school community that share the responsibility for creating open lines of communication. Everyone should be working together to ensure that we know what each of our expectations are. As with any relationship, there are bound to be disagreements and conflicts. By having an established line of open communication, that likelihood is decreased, though. So the goal should be to have open, honest, and respectful, genuine communication. Let's listen as some parents talk about their feelings on views of communication. Well, I think we building the relationship with the school is very important to a child and their education just because it opens the doors of communication. You know, if something's going wrong, you've got that line already open and, you know, they can, it's an easier conversation to have if you know somebody. I think building relationships with the school um, really work well when they get to know the entire family, um, like at events, they would come in, like the administrators or the staff, people that aren't typically involved with her, but still make decisions within the school for programs and for my daughter's education and other children with special needs. If they get to know the family as well as the child on a personal level and get to see how they interact outside of school in an unstructured environment, um, I think that's what makes it work, is getting to know them more on a personal level. I just think the opportunity just to be able to have that open communication. Um, for example, if I, if I had an idea that I wanted to try to help implement, you know, just to be able to approach the teacher and say, I have this idea, I really think it would, you know, and just by having that parent come into the classroom, you know, not all together, but each taking a turn, you know, just to be able to have that opportunity to say, I have this idea, could, you know, could you allow me to implement it or be part of that process? We have found that some of the biggest holes happen when teachers send information home via the kids. Remind your parents to send blah, 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 blah to school. Only our child's nonverbal, so then we don't get any of that information. So we get lost in the loop often um, when it could have just been a little note on his paper or a quick email to us um, and sometimes that gets missed um, even if the child isn't 
is able to speak the, the memory issues and remembering to do that, sometimes relying on the children to give the parents the information doesn't work well. We are encouraged, I think, to a point as far as communication. We've asked that a sheet be sent home every day, just filled out with what his day was like, you know, what he did, what his mood was like, how he ate, things like that. So we asked for a sheet to be sent home every day, and that's definitely helpful just because you can't always get the verbal. And with Christopher having a para, there's a lot of communication back and forth with that person as well, which is helpful when you can't talk directly to the teacher all the time. I think a big part of it is uh, getting the information out to the special needs families and kids. I mean, in our small community, I don't think we're, I don't think we're purposely excluded, but I guess since there's so few special needs children, they don't really think about us that much. So they don't really get the information to the special needs classes like they do the general education. So some of these events and stuff that they have, you know, we don't go to because we, we didn't even find out about them. So getting that information to us and making it available to us would be a big help. Our best relationships with people in the schools, and I recognize this as a teacher as well, are those relationships where you don't only hear about the negatives, you get the exciting, awesome things that happened in the day too. Um, and so just kind of communicating and remembering to communicate both. I think sometimes um, as a parent of a child who has disabilities and significant medical issues, it seems like sometimes you dread walking in the door because you're not sure what you're going to hear or find out. And so greeting with a positive has always been our best, the people I would say we have our best relationships with <laughs> because you want to go in and see them versus it you know, being... Dreading, dreading the experience. <laughs> what am I going to hear now? <laughs> We try very hard to be involved um, and not be over, not over involved, but just what can we do to help? How can we, you know, pitch in? What do you need donated to the class? And we don't hear anything. I, there, I, I, my guess is there's so many parents that want to be more involved, but just don't hear from the teacher at all on what they need. I think, and then when I flip it, sometimes I think as teachers, we feel like we're overwhelmed and there's so much to do, but are we really accessing all of the resources we have? We have how many parents in each classroom, and many of them want to jump in. My son is in the same school district that I teach in, not the same building, but the same school district. So I kind of see it both sided. Um, it becomes... <laughs> As teachers, we say we want the parents involved, we want the parents involved, and then sometimes when the parents are involved and are sending an email asking a question, not asking for clarification, I think sometimes as teachers we feel like they're second-guessing us. And to remember that if a parent's asking a question, they're probably just trying to be more involved and understand where you're going with it. When parents are asking questions, not to think that they're second-guessing you, just recognize it as awesome they're involved <laughs> you know whatever whatever the question is they're involved and they're going to be more willing to help you out if you're helping them with giving them the insight that they need I think one thing that um, I guess I would like to say to teachers is to remember that a lot of times parents who have children with disabilities come with a lot of baggage we've been through the trenches and we're sensitive and tender and um, sometimes we jump to conclusions only because we've already seen it and done it. And so the more information you give us, the less likely we are to wig out on you. <laughs> As we talk with families and community members about involvement, the unsolicited topic of inclusion often bubbled up. There were multiple calls for acceptance of children with disabilities and their families integrated in much that was shared with us. Let's pick back up with Jamie and her thoughts. We believe that Christopher goes to school for an education. Um, and so we prefer that he's participating in all the academic events. If there's a book writing activity, he can do that. He can make choices. He can do drawings. 
And so just to assume because he's nonverbal and can't write, uh, he can still do those activities. And so um, I, just, I just really see um, both with my child and as being a teacher in the classroom, the huge growth that happens for everybody with inclusion. Even if it's a team building activity or a, anything, I teach health and PE and, and I have full inclusion in my classroom of children with all levels of disabilities and I have a very strong belief that proximity is not inclusion. Putting a kid in a physical space is not including them. We wouldn't let students just sit there and do nothing. Um, so it goes across the board. And that's gonna look different for every kid. So to give one answer, you can't. But inclusion is not proximity. We've gotta get them actually doing, working with the education, working with the curriculum, with the other students. I think sometimes they assume that because Angela has special needs that she's not capable of doing some of these activities, which some of them she's not, but she could be a part of some of them if, if they altered the way things are done slightly, you know, to make it more available to her. So I, I think that's part of it is just uh, making them aware that she is perfectly capable of doing a lot of things and being a part of a lot of activities. You know, I'm trying to work with the school and outside sources to allow him to be, you know, as typical as possible in, inside the regular classroom. There's a lot of benefits to being around people with special needs, you know, so I think it's, it's not just, you know, the kids with special needs being um, benefited, but I think it's also, you know, the opposite of that too. I think it's good for other kids to be around that as well. So I think it's a mutual relationship. I think having, well, in our case, having a trained, uh, very um, well-trained para, a para who believes in inclusion, is a, paras are your lifeline for everybody, as a teacher and as a parent and as a student. Um, and having them trained and getting paras, again, training, training, training. It benefits children to have the community at large interested and involved in their education. When community and schools come together with a vested interest in the well-being of children and families, there is successful community involvement and better outcomes that lead to future productive citizens. Let's start with the views about what families need from the community, and then we'll also hear from Dr. Karen Maloney from Karen Connections near Galena, Illinois. Dr. Maloney built the Arena of Dreams on a lovely rural site, which includes stables, a therapeutic pool, and other recreational activities. Dr. Maloney and Sabrina Schultz will discuss with us the intentions for the arena and the community, as well as the use of modifications to include children with disabilities in many activities. Our small community is very uh, sports oriented, you know, t-ball and basketball, football and those kinds of things, and that's kind of what brings our community together. So if we could get involved with that, you know, uh, we would feel more of a part of the community. Getting to know her more in depth and outside of school allows you know other people to find out more detailed information about it. And when we're out and about in the community, people knowing her and knowing those things about her makes it easier for us. When it comes to community events, our community, um, whenever they hold an event, let's say it's a contest, um, we automatically think, oh, we can't go to that because everything is always set up for typical uh, children. It's not modified for special needs children at this time. Um, and I think that's just because there's just no awareness in our area, or very little. The collaboration, I think with anything, I think we need to network. And um, I don't own this place. Um, my philosophy with this is it's a center to use if anyone has a dream, it's called the Arena of Dreams for a reason. It's not only my dream. If people have thoughts and want to have an idea that seems reasonable, really open to various aspects, anything that's going to help children. It would really be my hope and my vision to get community and school involvement in what we're doing currently. Um, like I said before, specifically with our Young Athletes program, it is um, designed to have typically developing peers and community members, family involvement within what our schedule is and you know what our curriculum is. 
So it was really in our plans to get school involvement and continue to bring those typically developing peers and community members into what we're doing, but not necessarily within the walls of school and school you know, academic programs. Um, what we've been doing so far is passing out literature to the school districts in our area to invite them to come out to um, our event here and, you know, kind of educate them along the way as we educate, you know, our kids that we're working with that these are things that you're going to constantly see in the environment, in society, and this is how you modify things and this is how you accept people. People, everybody has quirks, you know, whether it's they don't like a certain food texture or they don't like certain colors or certain, you know, way clothes feel, everyone has their quirks and it's just learning how to accept those things in other people and that's kind of what we like to do here and we're all about wanting to educate the community. As research confirms, it is important to involve families in all aspects of their children's education. In order to partner with families completely, they must be part of the planning and implementation. Parents can help educators by assisting with routines, finding other people to help do things that educators don't always have time to do, and by providing connections to the community and giving ideas for activities that could enrich and enhance what happens at school. Parents can be involved by asking teachers and staff what they need help with, share ideas for educational opportunities, volunteer to assist in the classroom or on the playground. Family members can also help with trips, visits to community venues, setting up and participating in activities, and projects, and perhaps even with fundraisers to buy equipment and materials. Schools that are the most successful in engaging families go beyond the traditional concepts of family involvement and engage families as true partners in the education of their children. They share responsibility, collaborate, and support and enlist all members in decision making and planning. This takes time and practice, but the outcomes are well worth it. Some strategies include schools that get to know families and develop relationships with them, providing information and training both staff and parents, becoming less hierarchical and getting more personal and accessible to families, bridging the gaps with culture, language, and communication, tackling problems and issues when they arise and focusing on solutions, Building trust is paramount. Tapping into community resources and enlisting partners within those rich environments helps build the school. There is no one right way, no one size fits all. Yet, communication is key. Flexibility and diversity are critical. Please invite all stakeholders and remember that change takes time. It's easier when we build on success measure and evaluate what is done so it can improve over time. Expect the best. Often, what we expect is what we get. Some suggestions that I have um, to help the community involve children with special needs like my daughter um, would be to include us in the actual planning of the events in the community um, before they actually happen so that we don't show up to an event and then have to just go home because there's no way to involve her. Um, I think that would be very beneficial. Just raising awareness in general um, because even the, the actual event might be, um, be set up to involve her, but if the, the people around us are not aware of children with special needs, sometimes you could feel um, like an outcast. And I think if, if there was awareness raised in the community itself in general um, about children with special needs or adults with special needs, um, parents like us, families like us would be more comfortable with attending these types of events in the community. My daughter um, hasn't been included in planning activities, or at least our, us as parents haven't been included in planning school activities um, as of yet. Um, I think it'd be beneficial um, because they get, um, they'll make it more um, accessible to her. Um, 
sometimes she can't be involved in activities because they don't know how to involve her. As you, as you teach for more and more years, you learn more and more and it gets easier to do it. Um, especially if, if people grew up in an environment where they weren't around children with disabilities and then they're expected to have a child with disabilities in their classroom, they feel overwhelmed. They don't, they don't know what to do. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't want to but they, they need assistance in getting there. You can do so many cross-curricular things. I mean, whatever the topic is you're teaching, there are things in the community that do that. So if you're teaching money or you're teaching, you know, any of those basic skills, have a social in the bank lobby and they meet the president of the bank or, you know, there's just, you just gotta tie it into what you're doing. What What's the history piece? If you're learning about animals and farm, talk to a farmer, take have the family event out at the farm. I mean, it's just kind of, it's what, are, what, are, what are you doing? What are you, teach, what are you teaching? <laughs> you can tie it right in. Um, so sort of like the mystery reader, but just a little bit more than that. Like I have this really, you know, for sign language, you know, my son learns sign language. So around Valentine's Day, there's this really neat thing where the kids can paint their hands and they'll, um, you know, make a print and then you glue down the you note. Know. So in other words, like showing them Here's another way you can say that, you know, and, and kids love sign language and parents are like, oh, my child's learning, you know, so ways that maybe typically aren't, um, you know, just to bring creative ideas to the traditional classroom. We do a lot with the um, Park and Recs program. Um, they do many things for children um, of all ages, um, but they also have a great um, special recreation department that makes modifications for our child to be in regular. He takes, for example, right now he's in swimming lessons with everybody else and they've made amazing modifications. He has a one-on-one -on -one in the water so he can do swimming lessons with everybody else. Because you, you, know, you have a child who's very typical and has never been around anyone that might be labeled different. And so I approached them and said, you know, I have these books that I have researched that are just about being different. Could I bring that in? And so I was able to come in and, and read those books and kids would ask questions. You know, one time I said, you know, if for example, uh, when I read my friend Isabel about, again, they don't really mention the Down syndrome, it was just like, she's, for example, she's slower than me, she can't run as fast as me. You know, and I approached the children and I said, what is something you could do with someone who maybe can't run or keep up with you and they're like, well, you could do anything. You know, you could play hide and seek or you could play tag and they just, you know, they were still very, you know, why couldn't you? The African proverb, it takes a whole village to raise a child, supports what we will hear next. Let's take advantage of what the community has to offer. Imagine what can happen if everyone works together. I am really not in the, the education field, um, but what I'm hearing is that there is a, an outcry that they need to be listened to, I think. I think that's a key. Um, listen, see if how it would be reasonable from an economic, a financial, um, however you figure all these out, to have every child have and be given the capability to achieve the maximum they can. If I'm really seeing argumentative or, or really unhappy parents, then I think that's my obligation as, uh, I'm always a physician trying to heal. Um, you negotiate, you bring it to the school and say, why don't we have a meeting and get everyone together and try to make this work, or see as a mediator. Um, and I know they have programs and organizations, and I think the families need to understand that there are mediators um, that are out there. Um, and to contact them, and if they don't have them, then you have an issue, develop your own thing. I think you can't just sit there and say, it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. Building that relationship and building the trust between the school and the family is vital for the development and skill building for the children, whether it be social skill building or academic skills. Um, the family is really the foundation for that and working with the school is so vital for the development of the child and their academic success or personal growth and success. 
really just having a way to communicate. I have, um, and I'm sure other agencies do this, they contact schools and I think the schools have to be open to allowing the information to filter the, to the parents. I feel there is this bizarre ownership with any aspect. I've taken care of the homeless, done all kinds of things in my life, and um, it seems like you're so blinded and it's my people, and we do, you, you, you become almost afraid to allow anyone in because there is competition with money and grants and you know I, I think we gotta just like get rid of all those fears and just realize why you got into a thing in the beginning. I would think all of us do this to help people so why don't we just like all work together. So what have we learned from these families and community members? We've learned that we need to take a proactive approach to family involvement. It is vital that schools and community members consider the needs of all children and their families. They can't do it alone. It takes the families, the schools, and the community working together. There is no one right way, no one size fits all. Communication, adaptations, and modifications are crucial for all stakeholders to consider when planning for family involvement and its implementation. That's the proactive approach to promised outcomes of established research on family and community involvement.